Over the next 15 minutes, I will take you through the topic of building a bank you know, from scratch, which you no know, 15 minutes you know, should be enough for that. And um, I'll, I'll wear different hats for that. I'll wear different hats. The first hat is as a banker or as an ex-banker. So until 18 months ago, I was at a Citibank in London, where I advised some of our bank clients about their strategy. The second hat I'll have is as an entrepreneur and uh, as a CEO of the Disruptive Group, which is a business builder. And uh, one of the projects that we're currently working on is actually building a bank. Uh, and the third hat that I would like to take is an, an, as an academic, so as co-founder of CFT, the education platform, and also a fellow of uh, Oxford. So we'll try to basically combine two things, which is theory and practice, and make sure that you know, in 15 minutes you have a good overview of what's happening in banking today. So first, what do we know about the banking landscape you know, today? What we know is that there are more and more new banks around the world. It is something that has started a few years ago. And if you look at this graph, sorry, at this graph here, you can see that you have more and more new banks. It started, and at the moment, it doesn't seem to stop. So why? Why do we see so many new banks you know, in today's world? Mainly three reasons. The first reason why we see so many new banks is IT cost. So it seems you know, quite obvious you know, for all of you in the room that you know, IT costs now have plummeted over the last few years. Let me just give you an example. Almost 20 years ago, I was CEO of a tech company in the US. The first $2 million that we raised were used to buy technology, to buy Sun Microsystems, to buy Oracle database, to buy software. Today, if I wanted to do the same, that would cost me, let's say, $100 per month on Amazon Web Services, which means that for less than your money 2020 ticket, much less than that, actually, you can have a very, very good IT infrastructure already. So IT costs have gone down quite a lot. Second reason is consumers, and Megan talked about consumers. Let me give you an example. Uh, I guess you know, some of you have had you know, teenagers you know, coming to your house you know, at weekend. What is the first question that a teenager would ask you when they go into your house? Exactly. So I guess you know, they have quite a few examples. Wi-Fi password. So for all these teenagers, well, the first thing that they're asking is Wi-Fi password, and you have you know, those you know, 10 teenagers you know, in a room, just you know, on their phones and not talking to each other, but perhaps you know, messaging each other. So of course, you know, consumer behavior is something that has changed over the last 10 years. And then finally, regulation. Regulation makes it much easier to launch banks in certain countries, for example, in the UK, and at the moment, it is expanding also in other countries. Conclusion of all of that, I'll give you just a very simple example. Conclusion of all of that is that the barrier to entry into banking has gone significantly down over the last 20 years. Let me give you a number. 20 years ago, one of our investors Europath Web was also an investor in a bank in France, in a new digital bank that was called The Bank, Z-E-B-A-N-K, the way you'd call it in France. The Bank was invested with $200 million, two years, 100,000 clients. That was the metrics of The Bank 20 years ago. Today, over the next few slides, I will show you how there are banks which are doing the same the same amount of time, but for 20 times less money. Okay, so let's go through you know, what we know from you know, this lower barrier to entry. What does it mean? It means first that we're seeing the rise of new banks everywhere in the world. We're seeing that in the US, we're seeing that in Asia, Africa, but also, and very importantly, in Europe. Why do we see so many new banks in Europe, and especially in the UK, compared to the rest of the world? IT cost is more or less the same, I would say. You know, consumer behavior you know, has changed you know, pretty much you know, everywhere in the same way. It's mainly because of regulation. And mainly because of regulation in the UK, where you have a two-stage licensing process that makes it much easier and much cheaper for new banks to be licensed. So this is something which we're going to see more and more in terms of regulatory changes that will allow for new entrants into finance. So the rise of new banks is a global trend. The second thing that we're seeing is the rise of what we would call specialized banking. 
So until now, until very recently, most banks would be full service, universal banks, catering to a very, very large number of people. Over the last few years, we've started to see the rise of specialized banking, so banks catering to a very specialized uh, target audience. For example, millennials, SMEs, children, underbanked, unbanked. It's quite incredible to see all of you with your smartphones. And uh, why are we seeing this? Why are we seeing this? Just because the cost of entry into banking has gone down, and because the cost of entry has gone down, you can actually afford to target a very specialized niche audience and still be profitable. So specialized banking is something that we will continue to see over the next few years. And then that leads to this very important question, which is, we need banking, but do we need banks? And this question is not you know, in the meaning of, you know, do we need banks, or is, it, you know, uh, you know, is there a future for banks? No, so it's not a question for my friends you know, at uh, ING or Mitsubishi UFG or, or Citi. It's much more from a regulatory standpoint. From a regulatory standpoint, a lot of the companies that I showed you before would be banks. So they are licensed as a bank. But a lot of the companies that I showed you are not banks, actually. And I don't know if I have my card. I don't know if you see this. It's, a, it's my Revolut card, so I'm doing a bit of publicity for Revolut. Revolut, what is Revolut? It's a card that basically allows me to receive money, to transfer money, to send money, to go and pay with my debit card. For me, it pretty much looks like a bank. But it is not a bank. It is not licensed as a bank, it is licensed as an e-money license. Why does it make a difference? We're going to see later. But which means that we're talking about banking, but for consumers, some of this will be banks, some of that will be non-banks. And finally, let's look at you know, who's behind you know, those new banks and those challenger banks. Of course, there would be a lot of new entrants, what I would call you know, startup banks, you know, getting to the space. But let's not think that it's only about startup banks and new banks you know, getting into the space, because there are a lot of projects, actually, which are directly launched by a bank, or where there has been an investment by a bank, or also, because you, or also where you have been an acquisition by a bank. So in terms of who's behind all these different players today, I would say it's much more open than just having new startups getting into banking. I would say traditional banking is quite active also in the space. So now that we've had this overview, let's go back to the initial question, which is you know, how do we build a bank you know, from scratch? And you know, banking you know, can seem quite, I would say, you know, confusing or complex you know, in general. You know, if we talk on the regulatory side, from you know, Basel III to you know, capital adequacy, etc. Uh, and you, when you look at a lot of these companies, you know, what is the common point between you know, all these different companies? So what I wanted to do is to take a very simple framework, and let's go back to the basics. You, know, you want to build a bank, you know, how, do you do, how do you do it? And basically, you do it by looking at where you're going to spend your money and how you're going to make your money. Quite simple. So you will start by spending your money. And how do you spend your money? You will spend your money mainly on the operation side, and on the regulatory side. I'll just forget about you know, the marketing side, you know, customer service, etc. Let, let's start you know, very, very simply. We'll spend money on operations and regulations. And how will you make money? You will make money, of course, by having clients. So you'd want to have a certain number of clients. But that also depends on your revenue model. How are you going to make money from each of the clients? So let's go on the expense side. So how much does it cost to launch a bank? So you remember we talked about the bank 20 years ago in France, you know, $200 million, for example. Today, if you wanted to launch a bank, you know, how much would it cost? So we talked about regulatory cost and operation cost. Very, very simply, we could say, let's say in, in the UK, for example, I wanted to launch a digital bank. Regulatory cost, let's say you know, $20 million, which a part of that would be to prepare for your regulatory submission. A bit of that, or a lot of that, actually, would be for your capital to start. 
and then operation costs, let's say you know, $40 million that uh, you need you know, to create your technology you know, infrastructure. For that amount, you're more, uh, my, more, you're more likely to do it yourself than to buy you know, off the shelves. So that's one way. So $60 million could get you started, for example, in the UK to launch a digital bank if you wanted to launch a digital bank. So that's one way of looking at it. So quite good already, you know, much, much cheaper than $200 million a few years ago. So let's say you know, two or three times cheaper. But actually, there's also another way of doing that. And uh, Megan talked about Neobank. So I talked about my Revolut card, for example. How much does it cost to launch something like my Revolut card? Regulation costs, much, much cheaper, because it's not licensed as a bank. It's licensed as an e-money license. So let's say a million dollars. Operation costs, $5 million. Why much cheaper? Because they're much more narrow in terms of services. They don't offer whole banking services from checking account, savings account, etc. It's much, much more narrow. And so basically, here you can start with not $60 million, but $6 million. So what have we seen in terms of cost over the last few years? Went from, let's say, $200 million to $60 million to launch a bank, to $6 million to launch something that looks like a bank. So there's a real question in terms of your regulatory approach and your product strategy in terms of how you want to build your bank because there's a big impact on your cost. Let's look at the second part, which is clans. So clans will have a big impact on your side, not just on the uh, revenue side, but also on the expense side. Why? Because in banking, one of the uh, most expensive costs is still customer acquisition costs. How do you make to acquire clans? So if you acquire clans, and it costs a few hundred dollars to acquire those clans who are used to a free service, that's not great. But on the other hand, if you are looking at, for example, you know, SME banking, where you have clients who are willing to pay, and at the same time, they're underserved at the moment, so which means less customer acquisition costs, it could be quite interesting. So second part is about clients. And then finally, once you know who your clients are, you need to think of your revenue model and how you're going to make money. And here, that's a real question for the new banks. That's a real question, although the cost part we know quite well, the revenue part is much more of a question. Why? Because in a traditional bank, a traditional bank would make money mainly from two different sources of revenue. The first one, which is around two-thirds, is about interest income, you know, the difference between lending and borrowing. So the two-thirds would be from interest income, and the, the rest, one-third, would be from transaction fees, for example. A lot of the new banks at the moment are starting much more on the transaction fees, so the 35%, which means that they leave two-thirds of the revenue part untouched. And so there's a question for all those new banks of whether you can create a large business only by focusing on transaction fees and leaving this other part, which is interest income, untouched. But knowing also that the interest income is real finance, I would say. It's not about technology. It's really about transformation. It's about credit risk. It's about real, proper finance. So that's the first part of the question, which is, how are you going to make money? Is it only about transaction fees or interest income? <coughs> and the second part of the question is, what are you going to do about data? A lot of business models of new banks over the last few years have been about monetization of data, just like Google, for example. The reality is that so far, over the next few years, we haven't seen that many banks that have been successful in monetizing data. So about, apart from, let's say, for example, Credit Karma in the US, we still don't really know how easy it is to make money from data in finance. So let me conclude on this part. How do you build a bank from scratch? I think the first part is very clear, is on the cost side. Costs have been going down very, very significantly. But today, you still have different models of launching a bank or something that looks like a bank, either in terms of a real bank, in that case, let's call that you know, $60 million, or a neo bank, and that costs 10 times less. So first question about this. The second one in terms of your customers, and the third one in terms of how you will be making money. Conclusion of all of that is that it's pretty much this, hopefully with this kind of framework that allows you to understand a bit more, you know, with that lens, all these different companies, what they are trying to do, how they are being licensed, what their revenue model is, and, you know, what is their cost structure. I think, you know, one takeaway would be that the barrier to entry into banking 
has gone down. So that is very, very clear. And so the question, of course, is that who else would want to benefit from this opportunity? Because we have all these new banks. But what we know also is that it's much more than these new banks. It's also internet companies. So perhaps it's not a coincidence that two weeks ago we heard about Amazon Bank, and two days ago, here at Money 2020, we heard about Grab launching, launching Grab Financial. So I think the conclusion is that over the next few years, banking is likely to be very exciting, but also very different. Thank you very much.